Hello, I'm John Pawson, and this is the Experiences Everything podcast brought to you by Grey Doors Events. In this first episode, we're talking to commercial head of events, Katie Whitby, to find out a bit more about her experience and to ask her how she got into the industry in the first place. She'll also be giving us some of her expert insights into how to create a seamless event in 2023. So without much further ado, let's get into it. Hello, Katie. So I just wanted to start by saying thank you for being the first one in the hot seat for this, uh, the first okay. edition, uh, first episode, if you like, of the Experiences Everything podcast. Thank you for inviting me. This is uh, very unusual. I've never done anything like this before. So this is, uh, yeah, this is going to be interesting. Well, you're you're very welcome. As I say, we we need to have great people sitting in the seat in the hot seat, and we thought we'd start with, uh, you know, start up there with one of the greatest. So. Uh, <laughs> I know that you've got plenty to to talk to us about and plenty of experience to to take us through. So the the way that we uh, that we operate on the Experience and Everything podcast is we start off by talking a little bit about you and about your experience, um, and then we'll we'll talk through some of what's hot in meetings or events right now. And I know recently that you were also in a similar hot seat for the Gradles Travel Travel Talks webinar. Um, for my first webinar as well, very which first went time. very well, by the way. I understand, so I understand. it got. Lots of great feedback. So um, I was watching, and so I made some notes. So we can we can go through some of maybe what you talked about there, and and just go into a bit of depth there. So yeah, first up, getting to know you a bit more, I suppose. So okay, I do I to, need wine for this, John? Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you've got some, feel free. You know, it's, it's very okay. relaxed. There's no pressure. Um, I guess as you tell me your stories, you might feel the need to go and grab yeah, some Yeah, maybe but... I might. Yeah, it depends on what you ask me, but go on. Off if you, you go. have to. Um, <laughs> so the first thing I wanted to ask, and this is uh, almost like a, yeah, one of the, the team building exercises that you guys m- might put on, I suppose, okay. is um, what did you want to do for a living when you were when you were a kid? What's the first thing that you remember thinking, oh, I'd love to do that? OK, yeah, I think it's the remembering bit, isn't it? I, I, um, OK, so... The, the the thing I remember most, I guess, and sort of really where it all started, well, I say my career, it wasn't my career, but um, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Um, oh, and, wow. and like for many, many years, really, really, truly believed that that was the case. And, and I don't know where I got the idea from. And um, however, now I do know how, you, how I got the idea. Um I, um, my son, I realised what it was. It's, it's the Top Gun. It's the Maverick piece. I must have watched too much Top Gun and I decided that I wanted to be a fighter pilot because I now have a 13-year-old son who is in exactly the same position as me um, <laughs> and he wants to do exactly the same. So my pe- the, the penny has dropped, shall we say, over the last, um, the last year or so since Top Gun came out. But, um, you know, at 14, 15, when I was watching that, I absolutely, that was categorically what I wanted to do. And um, I was determined and I even was deciding that I was going to do my A-levels because I wanted to go in as an officer. Wow. So going at a higher level. So not just going as a squaddy, going as a higher level. And um, I did realise that, as you can see from my glasses, um, I am blind as a bat. So um, <laughs> they were never um, Might make it tricky, yeah. Might make it a little bit tricky. They are never going to let me in. Um, really, really got terrible eyesight. But then I was still determined. I was still going into the forces, um, and I wanted to go in as a as a personal training instructor because very sporty. Um, so wanted to go in in as one of those. So I went through the I went through the sort of the um, was it it's medicals and and the physical training mm-hmm. um, for the army and the RAF, um, and unfortunately I couldn't get in purely because of my eyesight, nothing to do with the fitness tests or anything. It was all to do with that. So I was gutted. I mean, I was absolutely gutted um, and was had started doing my A-levels. And I was like, well, what's the point? What's the point? I really Not sort of me. really had had the, um, had, so what's the point of doing this? And um, so I told my mum and dad said, don't want to do this. I'm going to drop out. Um, and as you can imagine, they were a little bit horrified and thinking, oh my God, what is she going to do? Um and I couldn't get around. So at 16, none of us could sort of, you know, we couldn't, um, mm-hmm. you couldn't get around. You could, what is it, 17 now, I think, when you, you need driving license. So um, mum and dad said, you know what, if you want to, if you want to do something, why don't you try go work at the local hotel? So I was like, oh, brilliant. So um, Nailcoat Hall in Berkswell, bit of a shout out to uh, mm-hmm. Rick Pressman, who, who still owns that and I'm very fond of, um, started there when I was 16 behind reception. 
Um, but, and I absolutely loved it. You know, that was absolutely hotel environment. Absolutely loved it. Um, but I did use, I remember very vividly, I, mum and dad were not up for getting up at 7am. They were, they were mm. not up for that. So, um, dad bought me a, I think it's called, um, what are they called now? A r- rally bike or a, what the dirt bike? It was a dirt, a dirt bike. bike. Wow. It was a dirt bike and it was yellow what he bought me and he spray painted it yellow. Uh, sorry, no, it was purple when he bought it and he spray painted it yellow. And you used to hear me coming down the road. Everyone would know for like miles. It was like <laughs> really loud. Um, so, yeah, so I, that's what I wanted to be. But I ended up in hotels. And is that was that the sort of segue then to get you into events? Was um, did, you, did you start working in kind of the events part? Well, I ended up, well, yeah, I ended up um, sort of doing two or three years, I think, um, I, was, I was there for, and then uh, hit 18 and then decided that I'd um, I'd go off and have a load of fun. So um, I did my uni years, as they say, out in um, on campsites as a kids courier um, for Eurocamp and Key Camp. Oh, wow. Did um, you go on the scrambler bike? Did you? Uh, no. <laughs> took it with <laughs> you? across France. Yeah. I don't think I got very far. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It literally only got me to the hotel and back, I think. It used to break down all the time. Um, well, no, so I did. I kind of went through that fun period where you rebel a bit and drink too much and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then when I came back, um, I started working in a travel agency, uh, not a travel agency, a um, estate agent. And um, long story short, um, one of the customers that I was selling the house from said to me, I'd really like you to come and work for me. Um, I've got an agency. Um, I've got a small agency in Bakewell. Um, would you come and work for me? Because you're so good at getting back to people and keeping them in the loop about houses. So, um, you know, and, and all that follow up. So that's kind of where I started. So I started in the business travel section there um, and then ended up down in London um, as, a, as a wedding coordinator. But that was, again, you know, um, I was like, oh, I, I fancy going down to London. So I ended up doing weddings down in London. So that's how I ended up down there. Wow. So, yeah, not not your typical route in necessarily. But then I suppose, is, is there a typical route with, uh, with the crazy world of events? No, I think I think what happens is you kind of fall into it. If you if you don't know that you're going to do event management or you don't know that that's where you, you want to go, you just kind of fall into it. Um, you start working and there's a massive love and a passion for hotels. And, you know, mm-hmm. that environment is very much a, a family orientated or certainly was anyway, um, many moons ago. Um, and, and then sort of, I guess, my career sort of evolved from there. So I sort of then went into sales um, and then went into sort of arranging big events for hotel groups. So, so, it, so it evolved. But I think, I think if you start off in the hotel industry and, and the travel industry, you very rarely come out of it. It's very much sort of, you know, we all love it. You know, it's, it's yeah, just a yeah. great big family. Once you're in, you're in. You're in. You ain't going anywhere. <laughs> so um, moving on to this kind of next, next of these sort of getting to know you questions. Um, I wanted to know if there's been any, uh, well, what, what's been the sort of craziest or um, most amazing experience that you've had of, of working in events? You know, some of these, some of these things that, you might, you know, uh, as an outsider, you wouldn't even think of potentially. Um, oh, I mean, I've I've had some brilliant experiences. So, so you know, we've done events out in the in the you know we've done events out in the Middle East where you've been on camels and you've done quad biking and you know, um, you've been off on on the uh, catamaran, you know, in, in the ocean. That I mean, there's some amazing, exp- absolutely amazing experiences. But from an event perspective, I think my best experience or my my most fun time was organizing um pre-match so so when I, I used to work down in Wimbledon and we used to organize at a local hotel we used to a beautiful hotel down on Wimbledon Common um and we used to organize um pre-match um packages mm-hmm. uh, not tickets just pre-match match packages so champagne out on the terrace afternoon tea theater trips very nice you know that the outside theater before the um before Wimbledon matches and we had to we literally worked 24 7 for like the whole two weeks and we had lots of people staying with us um sort of real sort of um I suppose high net worth individuals really Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. famous people and that sort of thing um but you had to diversify so one minute you'd be you'd be serving canapes or you'd be directing somebody to the next minute you'd be in a mini 
you know, mini minibus taking people back and forth to, to Wimbledon. Um, and I remember one time I was asked to go and pick somebody up and go and wait outside a certain gate. I couldn't remember what gate it was. And I sat there for ages and I was ringing the hotel going, why, why am I sitting here for ages? It'll be there in a minute, be there in a minute. I was like, right, okay. And then all of a sudden, sort of this guy comes out of the, out of this sort of the door with a couple of bodyguards or whatever you call them and um, security guards. And it was uh, Pete Sampras. So I was like, oh my God. I was like, what do I do? I was like, okay, this is no pressure here, no pressure. So drove him back to the hotel and it was fine. And he was, you know, he was chatty. He was not, he was a nice guy. Um, and, and sort of dropped him off. But you know, when you're like, wow, I mean, in that time, he was huge. I don't think he, he'd lost any matches. I can't remember what, what he'd won, but wow. um, massive. But I guess um that was really special, I think, working Wimbledon because it was local, it was a local um you know, it's in the UK and it's such a special environment is Wimbledon. Yeah. So, uh, it, it brings out the best in everybody and, and everyone gets involved locally. Um, but then I've never seen an actual match at Wimbledon, which is a bit gutting. You've not, you've not been to see one. You did all no, that work. Never. And that is one thing I would love to do. I've ne- just never had, while we were working, we never had chance. You know, no. some people would be able to go off and, and watch them for the cheap seats on an evening, but we never got chance. So, um, yeah, I watch it every year, but I've never actually been, which is really, I guess, really bad. I, I, it, it sort of proves, you know, when you're busy doing the work, you don't have time to, to yeah, stop, and, so. <laughs> stop yeah, and take so. yeah. it in. Yeah, I suppose so. It's true. Yeah. So all yeah, these, all so. these, you know, catamarans and, and June buggy and all these. Well, they were sort of, great. They were <laughs> great. I guess it was probably more because I was young and it was probably my first experience of what what it's like mm. to be involved in a sort of a global event you know and I think that for me and I, I saw so many famous people and Goran Ivanisevic and you know um we saw Posh Spice um Sarah uh what she uh she's married to Prince uh Sarah Ferguson Sarah Ferguson yeah, yeah. um loads of people loads wow. of people um so I think from that perspective that was that was probably the most fun time Fun time. Yeah, fantastic. Um, from fun to funny, I suppose, is the the other angle on okay. this. In terms of, are there any uh, moments uh, throughout your events and meetings and events career, if you like, where that stick out as particularly looking back at least comedic? They might not have seemed funny at the time, but are there any are there any parts of your career that you think, you know. <laughs> Looking back, that's hilarious now. What am I allowed to say? Am I, I'm not, I need to be really careful here. Hey, look, you're, you're allowed to say whatever you like. If, if, if it's going to be a legal issue, you know, we can get okay. the bleeper out and just bleep, okay. bleep famous names no, no. if there's, you know. <laughs> no, no. I'm just thinking, what am I allowed to say? So I just be, I, I'll be careful, I think. Okay. Maybe I'll be careful. slightly careful anyway. There's loads of things, um, loads of things. Um, but probably one of the, I suppose one of the big standout ones for me was when I was in London I was organizing weddings so and and, and we're not talking you know we're we're talking not necessarily huge weddings but Mm. very expensive weddings you know really really posh weddings and one particular wedding and I you know you get involved you get close to the bride and groom you know the ins and outs you know you, you sit and drink champagne with them and you chat about everything and this one particular wedding I was really excited about really really excited about and um looking forward to the to to them coming and getting married and everything and um I got in that morning and um basically all the chefs were ill literally every single chef in the kitchen there was a bug some yeah or <laughs> every single one and we were like wow okay uh fine so um it was quite an early sit down and it's probably about 12 one ish it was quite an early sit down sort of breakfast wedding breakfast and um the long short of it was um we rallied everybody we, we eventually got agency chefs but not until literally main course was about to go out mm. and i was, was in between um going outside making sure the the um the bride was topped up with champagne. If I'm honest, she had far too much. And I then gave a <laughs> bottle to the photographer to say, you need to keep her out here for another hour because we're not ready. <laughs> In between going into the kitchen and peeling potatoes, that was literally how it was that day. And um, we got through it. I mean, we were two hours late in service, but she died. She was uh, gone. I'm not going to lie. I mean, That's yeah. really bad. <laughs> yeah, as, long as, as long as the bride's having a whale of a time, then, then she you're, was you're a winning, ball. right? She had an absolute ball that time. But um, yeah, so so 
that was one of the ones you know you got through by the sort of the, the I don't know what the saying is, but um, skin of your teeth, skin of your teeth, that's seat it. Of your pants, um, one of those seat of your pants. That was one. Um, the only unfortunate thing was they they did get divorced six months later, which oh. I was really sad about. Oh, so no. yeah, all that those, wasn't all great. Those potatoes peeled for what? I know, for nothing. <laughs> nothing. What a what a waste of money. I tell you, it does demonstrate though the the kind of um, the whole. Uh, I guess, modus operandi, the ethos behind being an event manager is you're going to have to roll your sleeves up. Sometimes, yeah, you absolutely. know, it, something comes, uh, you know, curveball out the blue and you've got to just do what needs to happen. So it's... Um, and that happens a lot, actually. I think you do, you know, what what tends to happen is always something, that there will always be something, but what you've got to do is just look like you've got everything under control. Right. Yeah, yeah. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. We're walking slowly across the lobby, but elegant no, swan it's generally. The... Yeah. <laughs> now that's interesting. Somebody said to me, and this will make you laugh, is that somebody said to me once. I did a ski season as well, amongst all this, and somebody said to me that you have to walk around the ski, um, walk around this other chalet because we were um, hosts of chalets, and I was whatever you call it, cleaner or whatever chambermaid, mm -hmm. and they said you need to move around the chalet um, like a swan. Oh. And somebody said, hmm, she's, Katie's going to struggle with that. She's a little bit more touched like a rhino Whitby. <laughs> that seems unnecessarily harsh, if you ask me. But it's true because I'm not quiet and I do tend to stomp around a lot. So, yeah, that probably wasn't um, the greatest analogy of me um, moving around like a swan. Like a swan. I think I think the the difference between a swan and a rhino, I mean, surely you can meet somewhere in the middle there. But Yeah, yeah, probably. But fair enough, I guess. Um, so that's that's the kind of getting to know you bit. Cool. Unless unless you wanted to. No, I don't you know, think I need to part and... any more. I think I've done sufficient <laughs> enough to embarrass myself. Yes. But no, thank you very much for that because I think part of what's important here is is getting to understand the people behind Gradle's events and and you know get to know you guys as much as you can do. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I watched the, your uh, webinar the other day. Mm -hmm. And so I, I made a few notes and I just thought okay. if we could, we could talk about a couple of the bits that you brought up sure. um, in that webinar um, so that the lovely listeners of this podcast get to um, get to hear all the, the great tips that you had as well. Um, so the first thing which I which I jotted down and I thought would be really worthwhile to, to talk through is around budget um, and specifically I thought you might have some insights, I suppose, in terms mm -hmm. of what people tend to get wrong when they're thinking about their budget. Because for me, as an out outsider, if you like, um, if I was looking to plan an event, I might say, right, this is what I've got X amount here. Yeah. Um, and I might not have thought of all the different aspects. You know, are there, do there Absolutely. tend to be things which people have forgotten about? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's just, I think this is where your budget kind of gets blown out of the window, I think. And that's where, you know, all of a sudden your marketing budget that you, or your 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 invoice that you send into finance suddenly goes, you know, finance say, hang on a minute, I only gave you 10 grand and it comes back and it's a 15 grand bill. So yes, absolutely. So I suppose the first one is probably um, the bar bill. Um, because if you are having an event and you are, you know, having dinner and you, you know, you're having drinks and things, I think you need to be really, really careful about that because that can just go sky high. Mm -hmm. And if you've not budgeted for it, that can wipe out a lot of money. And right. I get, you know, because we all know, you know, it's not cheap. It's not cheap to, 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 to have, you know, alcohol and it's generally alcohol that's, you know, that, that's the cost, um, it, uh, 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 it, um, at events and then you always get somebody that goes over the top and starts to order shots or starts to order just something else at the end of the night and you need to decide what you're paying for and you need mm -hmm. to make sure that you then say to the staff make it very clear with the event manager that it's pre-dinner drinks and it's wine with the meal and that's it you know mm -hmm. then if they want anything else then they pay for it themselves you know and I think that's that's definitely one of those things that that goes out the window um, and I and I think the other thing that doesn't get taken into account and somehow I think ends up getting gob sort of swallowed up somewhere else hmm. is is travel and um, taxis and additional costs and then obviously that comes into sort of you know sustainability side of it but I yeah. think yeah it's those when you think about where you're actually holding your event can people walk from the train station you know can do they you know 
or do they need to get a cab? Is it is mm-hmm. it a tenner? You know, it's twenty pound round trip. But if you've got two hundred people, that can add up to a lot of cash. Um, so I think that's really key is 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 travel costs as well um, when you're organising events. It, it, you know, they do tend to get, as I say. Um, sort of gobbled up in in, in other areas. Yeah, people just expensing it, or yeah, you know, exactly. And, and they sort of then it's kind of missed from the budget, I suppose. Exactly, it's just quite important that those those elements are are accounted for. Of course, yeah. No, thank you for that. I think uh, there's certainly things that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of. Yeah. Obviously, the the bar thing, yeah. as you say, having your having your limits is important. Um, oh, and you also want people to be to be productive at the meeting the following yeah. day if they've got it. You don't want people getting you know getting trolleyed. I suppose you right. know it's not it's not unless that is what it's about. But make sure you allocate enough money to cover it. Yeah, gotcha. Um, well, thank you very much. So the 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 next thing I, which I wanted to pick up on was. Um, was probably linked in a way to the the budget side of things in terms of how to know um, who you should include as part of your event planning process. And I guess the the link there from the budget being, you know, making sure that finance are are aware of what's going on. But but if you had to list out just a, you know, count on your fingers, you know, departments, I suppose, who would you, who is your key people um, during the process? Okay, so it depends on the event, obviously. But mm-hmm. say you were say you were sorting out an annual conference, as a, as an example. Say you were doing an annual conference. I think generally, you know, marketing department are, are normally the ones that are sort of being asked to create the content mm-hmm. and to um, come up with what what you're looking to deliver. So they 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 will always be involved. Um, I think it's really important to involve HR, human resources, so that they can sort of put a bit of it. They tend to put the um, the real element of the more realistic they 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 sort of advise who who they think will come and who they won't because they know, tend to know people quite a lot better and um, finance of course um need to be involved without a doubt um because they need to be able to sign off on things um operation i suppose when i say operational people it's normally the people sort of to involve are, are very much the pa to the ceo or the you know any PA, key PAs in the business mm-hmm. that are, you know, look working for decision makers that will have an opinion on something, absolutely involve them. Because what you don't want to do is arrive at that event and the chief technology officer, for example, doesn't is going, what on earth? Who put this together? That is not, you know, that is not how we want to showcase our technology, yeah, yeah. for example. So I think PAs are absolutely critical. Um, and then probably if you have maybe a facilities manager or somebody um, similar, like a health and safety um, team or, or whatever, they tend to be um, involved as well. I don't think I've missed anybody out critically. I don't think so. Well, I guess the only the, the only main critical person is obviously your event manager. So If you've got you know, one, yeah, of course. If, it, if, I suppose, yeah, absolutely. And if you have an events team, then brilliant. But, you know, a lot of people do tend to outsource to people like like ourselves yeah. who then, you know, APA will come to us and say, we need to organise this event. You know, what do we need to do? And at that point, we advise which stakeholders, st- which stakeholders to sort of involve. Do you often get, um, well, this is an open question, it might just yeah, be a straight sure. no, do you often yeah. get um, PAs coming to you having tried to start putting the wheels in motion on something yeah. and yeah. and it just becomes too much it just becomes yeah it becomes huge and then also what you tend to find is everyone has an opinion and mm. sometimes it's easier then for an outsider to come in and collaborate with those teams and actually have those conversations and sort of say okay that's realistic that isn't you know yeah so sometimes cut through it's it. good yeah it's com- it's good to have somebody who's external to to, to rationalize sometimes um conversations excellent um brilliant uh, the next the next bit that i want to talk about is a thing close to my heart which is um you you spoke on the webinar and i keep going on about that so go and check it out okay. if you haven't seen it yet but um um but you spoke um about reflecting the brand values of yeah. of you know the client um as part of the event so i guess um my question is what what are the have you got any tips uh, to consider when thinking about those values in terms of how to how to reflect it what what yeah. would you do where can you where can you instill that brand um i suppose you know i think i think it's interesting it's a really interesting one because the majority of people will say to us we want somewhere unique 
and different. And you know what? Unique and different to me might be very different to unique mm. and different to you and to our audiences, you know? So uh, actually you really need to get them to define what they mean by unique and different. And I think yeah. that's sometimes the conversation starter that then evolves. And then they say, oh, we are launching this new um, funky contemporary um, piece of artwork or, or something that they're, they're launching. And then you go, ah, okay, I know the place for you. Now this is it, exactly yeah. perfect. Now we're getting there. Or, you know, you might have, um, for example, a, um, a very sort of um, traditional, um, company so that's been established for many many years like law firms and, and, and companies like that that are very sort of um, traditional and and you would more sort of look to put them in a more traditional sort of quintessentially British mm-hmm. um, you know um, venue um, and I think it, I think for me it's more about delving in and trying to understand what the, what they're about and understand um, a lot of the time as well is understanding what the senior leadership team like and wants yeah. because that you tend to find that people on those senior lead SLT teams um, reflect the the values. So you can then sort of, you can tighten it up really and and sort of delve a bit deeper. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting because I think as I say, from, um, from a brand and marketing perspective, it's that whole getting under, getting under the skin of the organization and like say of those senior leaders a lot of the time is, is where you can get those insights from. Yeah. Um, That's great. Um, there's a there's a few other bits that I wanted to touch on, um, and one of which ties back in with um, talking about the bar earlier with the budget. Um, but specifically, I thought a really interesting thing that you were talking about was um, food and and how it's kind of like you know it's fuel and and mm-hmm. actually that's certainly something that I in my limited capacity of of knowledge of the world of events mm-hmm. um, would have would have necessarily put too much stock in, but I thought it was really interesting um, how you spoke uh, with such insight into, you know, the food and the dietary of requirements, event, the dietary yeah. requirements yeah. but also the kind of, yeah, you know, how to make sure that you're not going to send people into a slump in the afternoon, all those, those bits, yeah. I think it's fantastic. So what are your top do's and don'ts when it comes to feeding your attendees and fueling well, I them think up. It's, I think it's really thinking about it. I think, for example, if everybody stayed, I think there's an element of waste. That I'll get off my rant of wastage in a minute because, well, I will. <laughs> I'll start on my little rant. Is that If you've had everybody staying over at a hotel the night before, you don't actually then need them all to have bacon sandwiches at mid-morning. They just need yeah. some sort of boost, some sort of energy boost or, you know, smoothies are always a great shout. I mean, just, but, but, but or juices. I, I went to an mm-hmm. event recently that did some really great juice sort of super boost that were they were green and that were they'd got all the right things in the spinach the carrots and all that sort of stuff and they were really nice but and and they were exactly what you needed you didn't need full-on cookies and cakes and danishes and 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 you know I think it's people thinking differently about it you know there was I think they had done little um uh sort of little um bread um what those little little suppose like canapes but not really but with Mm -hmm. smashed avocado and half a boiled half a boiled egg with some paprika perfect that's the type of things that are that are energy foods that you know we talk about nuts you know almonds all those sorts of things are energy foods and i think those are better for breaks than having a full blooming bacon sandwich it's not ideal because it sits on your stomach nobody feels great we might want it but nobody feels great after eating it and you need people to be on their on their game if they're there for an event and then lunchtime definitely not the big cottage pies or the big deep fried things you always you still see that you still see so much deep fried nobody wants deep fried now you know and thinking about all those other dietary requirements are just so key so i think lighter lunch you know um don't stodge up um and make sure again plenty of water is in the room and that sort of thing and then you know your afternoon if you want a little bit something sweet yeah go for something sweet sort of the afternoon afternoon tea you know everyone loves a scone you know and a scone's really nice again nice thing to have but but don't go full on with you know gattos and all that sort of stuff Mm. um and then as i think oh yeah i talked quite a lot about sharing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sharing buffets and sharing yeah yeah i just um i think it's just because they've become really trendy mm. and everyone's going for these you know these these um 
platters and I just think you just need to be really careful just make sure if if people have been traveling quite a long way make sure they've got a decent meal to eat when they get there rather than thinking that people will only want something light actually they, they still want a meal it doesn't have to be a heavy meal and I think sharing platters are, are literally salami and 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 you know roasted peppers and some dried tomatoes yeah. they're my favorite but they're just not necessarily enough enough to eat so I think it's just remembering all the different elements um Something that's really nice, I'll, I'll stop talking about food in a minute, but I get quite passionate about it. It's like bowl food. So if you've got, you know, you know, festival sort of bowl food is, mm-hmm. is very, very popular as well these days. That's a great idea, as long as there's enough of it, um, where you've got different dishes, you know, different options. Um, I think people want variety. Yeah, and I think, I think what's interesting hearing you talk about the food elements, just, you know, I th- maybe it's a generation thing now as well. You know, lots of people nowadays i would say are certainly generations younger than me are Mm. so much more aware of nutrition and you know making sure that they're getting everything they need um because i would i would go straight if there was an option you know i'd I'd be going straight towards all the you know stodge fried stuff all the stodge the pizza slices all that stuff because that's how my brain is wired but i'm sure there's plenty of people that um recognize um on their own accord the importance of having you know food that's going to be good for your brain while you're trying to well, sit it, there this and is soak it. stuff I think up it's and... bra- it, that's exactly it. i think it's your brain food you know i think that's the yeah. important thing and don't get me wrong because i i'm the i'm the classic one i mean at the moment i i'm not really overly keen on everybody sharing calories on their um their, <laughs> on everything you eat i'm like you go out for a pizza and it's like well that's 1500 calories i don't think i'm gonna have that but you know there is a time and a place for, for yes. things and i think particularly when you're there to learn and you're there to engage and, and you know ignite debate i think i think you you absolutely should be should be having brain food rather than stodge yeah absolutely no i see it's, it's it's a fantastic thing to think about you know and um and just you know keep in mind i suppose whenever you know aside from a, a, an arranged meeting you know or event but if you're going to a meeting and you've got the option you know what am i going to have there's a bunch of sandwiches in the middle of the table you know pick something that's going to do you some good and yeah. and you'll feel the benefit for it and you'll come away with a load of notes that make sense rather than yeah absolutely you know some Slumping you've been slumped on your keyboard yeah <laughs> exactly um so no, that's really that's really good i think you know there's there's plenty of other areas for us to talk about and dip into really? but i think i think actually for this first seminal episode of of experience and everything i think we've covered a decent amount there i think there's um there's areas that I'd really like to get into with either yourself or someone from the team as we as we go through this journey of of uh, experiences everything um, such as sustainability and the the kind of small details that can make the big differences. Um, so I, I think you know watch this space is going to be plenty for us to be diving into and talking about. Um, but for now, I just want to say thank you very much indeed for thank the you. time that you've given us today. Um, Good fun good i'm glad you've enjoyed it i'm sure that we will be needing you to come back on at some point so yes stay tuned and um we will be back with another episode of uh, the experiences everything podcast very very soon thanks very much